$186 billion. That's the estimated net worth of the top 10 Russian oligarchs. And to be honest, it's much, much higher than that. After Russia's invasion of Ukraine, a storm of sanctions is aimed at the hidden fortunes of these tycoons. Villas, castles, artwork, yachts, governments from all over the world are hunting them down to freeze their assets. But the oligarchs are cunning and their traces are hard to find until now. So how did they earn this wealth? Where did they invest it? And what can you learn from them to help your own finances? Here's the Oligarch's Guide to Business. And to help me see just how hard it is to hide money, I have my friend Dan. My name is Dan. I'm giving him $100. He has one minute to hide this, and I have five minutes to find it. If I can't find it, he gets to keep it. All right, go. Oh, shoot. A 106 meter long super yacht recently left Mexico before docking in the Fiji Islands, and the US is not happy about this. They're doing everything they can to prevent it from leaving. But why? They believe the owner is the Russian gold tycoon Suleiman Karimov. Hold on. Suleiman Karimov. Okay, but the US has a problem. They can't prove who owns it, because of course, the boat is registered to a shell company in the Cayman Islands. Welcome to the dark world of the oligarchs where nothing is as it seems. But what are oligarchs exactly? To put it simply, the Russian oligarchs are what you get when an empire collapses. You know, a fella named Plato, he wrote a book called The Republic. There he defines an oligarchy as a state where only a small number of people rule everything with greed and injustice. So it's not quite accurate to think of Russian oligarchs as just rich people doing rich people things like purchasing a yacht that supports a mega yacht. They're a ruling class protected by their government with ties that span between politics and the criminal underworld. This is one of the greatest stories of wealth accumulation ever. We hidden? Sure. Dirty underwear? Yeah. Facial moisturizer, what do we got here? Da Vinci's room. Awkward turtle. <laughs> How much damage can I do? Less than $100 for it. Is there anything sensitive in I'm here? Like, I was, I'm just sitting, Bag of nuts. I'm just sitting here trying to think, where do I have such embarrassing stuff in my room? Uh, I mean this, the second bed. <laughs> <laughs> With no it. kid. I don't have it. All right, I know you pride yourself in being tall. <laughs> Fake cigar. Fake? That's fake? The 1990s are one of the darkest pages in Russia's history. This is the decade that bred the first generation of oligarchs. After the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991, Russia was pure mayhem. Decadence, corruption, bears, everyone was on their own. It was a complete power grab. During this time, Prime Minister Boris Yeltsin started a process of privatization of the state-controlled industry. What this means is companies that were previously owned by the communist state were now on sale for pennies. But why? Well, Yeltsin wanted to transition to a capitalist economy, but he needed to do it quickly because communists still had popularity and the country risked being overthrown. So he started selling shares of these companies for next to nothing. This was called the voucher program. Just imagine if Texas or California auctioned everything they own, oil resources, mineral deposits, the DMV, for a fraction of the actual price. So in a couple years, 70% of the Russian economy had been privatized. And that's only the start. In 1995, Yeltsin needed money to finance his re-election campaign. So his administration made this grand final deal, an agreement with a few of the country's young and hungry businessmen. They would lend Yeltsin money for his politics, and in return, he would give them shares of the most valuable state-owned energy companies and resources. And Russia has resources, a lot of them. Gas, nickel, steel, oil. These individuals got to dip a toe into a fortune that usually belongs to countries, not people, leaving crumbs for everyone else. These are the first oligarchs, billionaires like Boris Berezovsky and Roman Abramovich. The second generation of oligarchs came with Yeltsin's successor, a former KGB officer who became the most powerful of all. Vladimir Putin. He's not present in any list of billionaires, but my guess is he'd certainly be first. Well, I, th I think created. Putin is significantly richer than me. When Putin got into power in 2000, he immediately saw what just happened. Fewer than 10 people basically owned all of Russia. For him, this was unacceptable. So he gave them a choice, Putin's version of red pill, blue pill. I'm using fish oil and vitamin C. The options were sell back part of what you took or face consequences. Now, most people chose option A, sell back part of what you took, but someone disagreed. His name? Mikhail Khardukovsky. In return, Putin seized his assets and sent him to prison for 10 years. This is basically like if Biden put Bill Gates in prison for not selling Microsoft. Immediately, all the other oligarchs, they looked at each other like, did he just really do that to big dog Mikhail? 
So they either fled or complied with the new president. In the years that followed, under Putin's power, came the second generation of oligarchs, a new wave of tycoons different from those of the 90s, those who are close to Putin. Old-time friends, members of the military elite, former KGB officers, Putin promised to get rid of the oligarchs. But the truth is that under his control, their numbers multiplied. What are these, clown shoes? <sighs> oh, God. Meet Genady Timchenko. In the 90s, Timchenko co-founded a judo club in St. Petersburg, where young Putin went to train. Now, thanks to his friendship with the president, Timchenko is one of Russia's most influential people, with a net worth of almost $20 billion. He owns gas companies, a villa on a Swiss lake, and a five-star hotel on the French Riviera. Not bad from a judo club. Or take the Rottenberg brothers, old friends with Putin, who also trained at the same judo club where there must be something in the water. They have construction companies, a bank, and a few luxurious villas in Italy. Or he Widely considered one of the most powerful people in Russia. He's the head of the giant oil company Rosneft and close associate of Putin since the 90s. And also, of course, he owns a $120 million super yacht called True Love. Yeah. Now, do the sanctions really hurt? Because on March 1st, Joe Biden declared a hunt for Russian oligarchs and created a task force to find and seize their assets. The guys who are the kleptocracies. <laughs> But these are bad guys. Overall, there are two main types of sanctions aimed at squeezing these people. The first one is imposing a travel ban. The second is freezing their assets. Some countries have outright seized their properties, but it's important to note that they're still legally owned by the oligarchs. That is, unless you can prove that their property was acquired through crime, something very difficult to do. But finding their assets is like trying to find your phone when it falls down that crevice in the driver's seat of your car. It's nearly impossible, and many blame the US and Europe for letting this happen. They're safe havens for oligarchs, not for your lost phone. Now, it might seem counterintuitive that they put all their money in the West where they're most at risk, but these people don't leave anything up to chance. Let's see how this scheme works and who really benefits from it. The oligarchs hide their possessions behind offshore accounts and anonymous shell companies, and they're assisted by top professionals from the US and Europe that help them invest their wealth in places like London, New York, France, or Italy. This all happens under their number one rule, never buy anything under your own name. Every Manhattan penthouse or super yacht is perfect purchased through a shell company. These companies are registered in tax havens that have strong corporate secrecy laws that make it hard for investigators to get any registration documents. Places like the British Virgin Islands, the Cayman Islands, or Cyprus are offshore hotspots. And what happens if you do manage to get the documents for a certain villa or a piece of art? Nothing. You won't find an oligarch's name on it. You find a frontman or a proxy. It might be their wife's name, their nephews, or a total stranger. But who makes this possible? As always, bankers and lawyers. They create webs to make this money disappear and get paid a fortune for their magic. Double or nothing, another hundred dollars. Hide this, if I find either, I keep both. If I don't find them, they're both yours. <sighs> okay. Oh boy. 30 seconds. Meet Alexander Ponomarenko. A tycoon now included on the sanction list. He made billions in banking and real estate. Also, thanks to the Rottenberg brothers, the two judo enthusiast friends with Putin. Now, a while back, the Panama Papers investigation revealed this dark net of offshore wealth tied to many high-profile billionaires close to Putin, and Ponomarenko was one of them. The investigation revealed that he bought himself a $45 million Gulfstream jet, because let's be honest, you can't be an oligarch with a peasant-like $3 million jet. The purchase was done through an offshore company that was set up for him by Ernst & Young, one of the top four accounting firms in the world. Then, of course, the offshore company called Torona LTD is registered in the British Virgin Islands, which means a lot if we consider the recent investigation by the Financial Times, who proved how UK and its territories became the capital for money laundering. The bank account was opened with the British bank Barclays, and there's a cherry on top here. The American law firm Latham & Watkins helped Ponomarenko by providing a personal reference for the deal, but he didn't do this all alone. He did it together with billionaire and politician Alexander Skorobogatyka. This man was part of Putin's political party for years, and yes, of course, he's a friend of the judo master Rottenberg brothers as well. Man, I gotta get into judo. The bottom line is, are they really hurt by the sanctions? 
The truth is that they are to some degree, but it's too early to tell just how much. It feels like the biggest damage is they now need to take a couple more steps to do the exact same things. We've seen just one example, but there's an organized and efficient system in place to hide and invest wealth that's very complicated to untangle and prove. This, of course, happens with powerful people all over the world. This isn't just in Russia. So far, the sanctions managed to freeze over 118 luxurious properties in the US and EU worth over $5.2 billion, including 15 bedroom mansions next to British royals, estates in the Caribbean, and villas in Tuscany. But what if I told you oligarchs already have practice with this? Right now, over 34 Russian billionaires have been targeted, but 11 of them were already sanctioned since 2014 when Russia invaded Crimea. You can bet that they've all had plenty of time to move their assets and make properties disappear. So the system of smoke and mirrors existed for years, not only to avoid taxes, but also in preparation for potential sanctions. And Western legal firms actually help protect these assets. They're a ruling class, sort of like a modern aristocracy protected by their government. And while the West is attempting to lay down the law, there's really only one thing we can be sure of. What they really own is a whole lot more than what we think. All right. Oh! <laughs> I got you! <laughs> I was so excited for a second. Man, I thought I had <sighs> Okay. You want to know where both are? Alright. The first one... If they're in your pocket, I'm... No, no, no. That would be cheating. The first one... You were very close. Oh! Is... Oh, no. Right there. It. Very, very close. That's the first one? That's the first one. The second one, you were real close when you were over here mm. because it's right there. No. Man, that one was hard. All right, what are you going to spend on? Uh, I'm going to actually put it into Anchor Protocol. <laughs> <laughs> Today's sponsor. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a sponsor. <laughs>